This is Around the League from UGASports.com. I am Dane Young. That is Brent Rollins from Pro Football Focus. And we have Jim Donnan, the College Football Hall of Famer and former Georgia head coach. We will get to Around the League, which is presented by Connor Grading and Landscaping out of Monroe, Georgia. Check out their Facebook page. We tell you that every week. We'll get to those games around the league, but it is quite a big day in recruiting. And it is for the Georgia Bulldogs within, I would say, a half hour of us beginning this broadcast Bear Alexander, five-star defensive lineman out of Texas, recommits to Georgia after being committed to Georgia and backing off of that commitment in the summer. Coach Donnan, I'm going to get out of the way and let you tell me about this kid and what it means for Georgia uh, and just the momentum of the program. Well, it started out yesterday with the Williams kid from Columbus decommitting from uh, out there on the West Coast of USC and, and making his mark here at UGA, a uh, position of need there, the Jack – position on our team where we're losing some good players. Uh, so I think that helped a lot. That was a five-star guy yesterday. And now today, Bear coming back in, a D lineman of, you know, massive proportions that uh, really gives you a thick guy that can can move around. And uh, going to Texas and get a kid like that, just an outstanding job by Coach uh, Trey Scott, our defensive staff, and uh, certainly head coach Kirby Smart. So uh, I usually don't get too uh, – shot in the butt about recruits, but anytime you can get big kids that can run like that, that's a that's a real good recipe to help you win. Don't you well, agree, Grant? Very much so. And especially, you know, just look at the momentum you have right now. You're the number one team in the country. You're getting five star guys coming back to you and or, you know, that they didn't. But you know, the biggest thing I think these guys are seeing are, are two two things. One is what when they're on campus and the atmosphere at Georgia and just the vibe and the feel and the culture around around Georgia right now is to me at, at another level. And then two, PT. You, you know, <laughs> the opportunity for PT playing time uh, is going to be there and there early uh, for a lot of these guys that are coming in on the defensive side of the ball. You got playing time and then you have, can you get me to the NFL? And when you're looking at Georgia's front six, front seven, depending on formation, you see a lot of NFL players on that side of the ball. And if they're all going to be going in, you know, one or two of the same classes, like you said, Brent, there, there's room to to come in and fill that spot. Uh, now you're looking at as much as like 12 guys that might that's, that rotate on your defense and play a ton on your defense right now that will not be on the roster next year. In fact, Coach, I saw a tweet from uh, your buddy Daniel Jeremiah, who we did a podcast with, uh, I guess, leading up to the NFL draft on the same feed, and he was saying that he started looking at the Georgia defense and said, draft all of them. Yeah, well, he knows what's uh, what's good about Georgia. I mean, he studies this. Uh, I don't know if I'd go that far yet, but uh, certainly let's just cool our jets here. I mean, we got a long way to go here. Uh, this, this team – uh, is going to be good and continue to, and it has been good. But I think all the playing time, as far as uh, really being a dominant team's ahead of us, we can continue to develop our secondary. And then our offense has got to get more consistent in their blocking. There's no question about that. I mean, we can't have as many hit and miss plays as we have, but certainly we've had a lot of more hits than we have misses. But uh, really uh, just uh, outstanding year so far. But to me, Everything's ahead of us, but we're here to talk about the rest of the league. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have but four games to talk about. So let's get on with it. Well, quickly, I guess we didn't have a UGA, UGA Sports, Sports Live. Live. So I guess I would let both of you, Georgia, Kentucky. And then if we want to kind of take it into uh, what it means for the league about halfway through the year, who's standing out, what's caught your attention. So, Brent, I'll start with you if you want to talk about Georgia, Kentucky, or if you want to talk about something else that's caught your attention in the first half of the season. Uh, I mean, Georgia is a story of the league thus far. I think they're dominant. You know, and they've been dominant. The defense is dominant. All the things that go there. But something that, to me, like I'm putting together the piece for the UGASports.com, it hopefully gets done today uh, if I get a chance to finish it up today. But one of the things that, you know, Kirby, the famous quote, it's boring, it's not explosive. Well, guess who's the number two team in the Power Five in terms of explosive pass play percentage? That would be Georgia. Right now, yeah, just behind Ohio State. Ohio State. Take out that UAB game, though. I mean, 
that, that helps. Still, that helps a they're lot. Still number, they're still number two. I it's, think we're very explosive, no question about it. And they got some cupcake teams too. But uh, to me, uh, that's something that we we got to develop better. Uh, I mean, no question that that it's there. But uh, you know, we made some big plays against Auburn. That's for sure too. So, uh, but uh, we, if we can keep that up, that'd be great. And I hope you're right there. Yeah, around the league, I think when you think to me, Tennessee is the team that to me, you know, I, I look at them kind of as in essence, the good, bad team, uh, like you see a team that goes eight and eight or nine and eight in the NFL that basically they beat and take care of the business that they can when, when they're better than other teams and they take care of business. It's a little tougher now for them, but still yet or tougher for them against better teams, but still yet program in the right direction. You feel a little, you feel good if you're ten, a Tennessee fan right now, I think. Yeah. I mean, they could have, they could have won that game the other night, uh, they knew how to play the quarterback draw. I mean, you don't go into a game and let a quarterback run for 200 yards. Uh, that was very poor adjustment by the Tennessee ball defense. But they, except for that, they played really well. But as far as what st- stuck out in my mind so far has just been uh, the, the Alabama defense. We thought it was going to be a really good defense this year going into the season with all those linebackers. And uh, we just thought they couldn't help but make solid improvement from last year. But we haven't seen that offensively they really kind of overachieved when you look at all the guys they lost. I mean, they're putting a lot of points on the board. The quarterback's playing at a maximum level. So uh, from a Georgia perspective, that's good that their defense hadn't improved. So we'll see how that works. But as far as what's, what's been impressive to me is just the fact that Georgia has been able to win on the level that Georgia has with the um, amount of injuries that they've had, uh, you know, people that aren't around the program, have no idea about all the guys have been missing games for them. And uh, they continued this next man up and then play extremely well. So uh, the rest of the year, a lot of things can happen. I mean, you know, people can knock each other off. Texas a and is playing a lot better now. Their quarterback's coming on. I think they're going to have a hard time losing the game. Uh, what's going to happen with Ole Miss when they get challenged? You know, how are they going to react to Auburn, Texas A&M, uh, those games? So there's going to be a lot of play – play in the West and watch out for LSU. Hey, I'm going to tell you a wounded team, a lot of pride playing for their coach. I mean, uh, they showed a lot last week and uh, they might just pull off a few upsets too. I think that that is my storyline of the first half is the importance of home field advantage, the importance of the atmosphere and the crowd and how easy it is for a favorite to go on the road and lose Alabama at Texas A&M. Florida at LSU. This is a weird year in college football. We've seen a lot of upsets already happen. And so if you're going to play at any of these SEC teams, it's infinitely harder once you get there. And so that makes what Georgia did against an Auburn even more impressive. The atmospheres are making a difference, especially in comparison to what we had last year. You need to tell Arkansas. Remind Arkansas that they played at home last week. (laughs) All right. That's a, that's a fair point, Coach. It, it's not foolproof, but uh, I, I've seen it make a difference. It, just beware is what I'm saying. Yeah, it's, it's definitely an advantage, no question. You know, Dane, Coach brought up a great point with, with Georgia specifically. Kirby Smart's not going to get talked about in the sort of coach of the year type things because, you know, they just they don't look at it because of the recruiting and, you know, Shane Beamer's comments about all the five stars that exist there. But think about what George has done with, you know, not playing at starting quarterback, all the injuries that coach has talked about. You know, you got an entirely new secondary, basically. So the coaching job that's existing here in Athens is, is beyond elite. Yeah, plus he had to replace a coach during the season. I mean, any way you look at it, that's that takes a lot out of your staff when you have to make routine changes in the games, one thing, but a coach's changes during the season is another. So I mean, if he's not coach of the year, I don't know who is at this point. You know, you got to look at Mel Tucker doing a great job up there, but they got to still play three tough Eastern Division teams. But uh, we'll we'll handle that here down the road. We'll pick our coach of the year. 
As we mentioned, we are brought to you by Connor Grading and Landscaping. It is a fantastic company based out of Monroe, Georgia, that if you're in the Northeast Georgia area and you have a yard that needs some work, whether it be from some of the recent rain that we had had or if you're just preparing that uh, as we head into winter, this is a good time that you don't have to worry about your grass right now because you know it's coming back in the spring. Check out the folks at Connor Grading and Landscaping. Have it where you can have your front yard tailgate for some of these road games. Better than even the tailgate you would have for a home game. Uh, they do great work uh, with different elevations, different things that you want to do. Brent, we talk about this. I, I saw that putting green that you were talking about that they've installed. Yeah, somewhere, I think, in, in um, Walton County. Somebody put a ni really nice putting green. But, yeah, so even outdoor needs, outdoor patios, whatever it is your outdoor wants are, they can take care of it. Check out Mike Connor and his crew at Connor Grading and Landscaping. All right, this is Around the League. Let's get into uh, some of the games that we have this week and kind of a, a little bit of a dud to start with Arkansas Pine Bluff at Arkansas. But, Coach, Arkansas needs a win in the worst way possible. Yeah, I mean, this is one that you chalk up for the Razorbacks before the season, during the season, when they made the schedule. I mean, on top of things, uh, Pine Bluff has, a, has had a rough year, and I think they're one and five. So, uh, I'm sure that, uh, like Coach Pittman, I w watched his press conference, and he's saying, hey, we can't be worried about down the road. We got to take care of ourselves, and we're going to be playing against our own standards. You know, uh, I'd like to send a memo to their uh, offensive coordinator. Hey, when you're ahead 17-14 at playing at home, you never throw a drop back pass out of your end zone. I mean, they ended up getting sacked for a touchdown, you know, and lost the ball. So uh, he's a good coach, but probably need to put that in his uh, repertoire or a memory bank that, that that's not worth the, ch the shot. Your defense, uh, you know, struggling a little bit. Anyhow, play around your defense and put the damn ball. I mean, that was a terrible call. I mean, that, that certainly enhanced – from that point on, Auburn took over the game. You talked about the defense, Coach, and Arkansas, the first few – you know, four games of the season when they were riding high, I think 21 maybe was the most they'd given up to Texas – and then these last three weeks against Georgia, uh, Auburn, and then Ole Miss, just, you know, 38, 37, 52, and then 38 points given up. That was the highest graded game of Bo Nix's career from a passing grade standpoint, that game uh, this past weekend against Arkansas that they gave up. And, you know, you got – it's it's sort of a tough set. And we talked about this, how for this team, it can kind of get off the rail quickly just because of their schedule. And now that Jalen Catalan, their safe, you know, sort of all SEC caliber safety is out for the year. Like this is, they need this week in a, you know, feel good week in the worst way because after this, it's versus Ole Miss at LSU, at Bama, and then, you know, a game against Missouri to finish out the season. You know, it's one of those where you're going to have a really good year, but it might still end up being like seven and five at best. Yeah. They got to get to a bowl game, which I think they can still do, but, uh, you know, everybody's caught up with this defense that Barry Odom's running. I mean, he, he you know, he's trying to run what Iowa State does, but uh, they've just uh, they've just completely discombobulated on defense, giving up way too many big plays and too easy to run at that soft front. So, uh, gotta give them credit though. Two big wins over A and M uh, and Texas, so it worked against those guys. But uh, they, they got to get their offense and defense coordinated as far as playing together you know, field position and all that stuff. And I'm sure Sam will do that. That game, Arkansas Pine Bluff and Arkansas is a noon Eastern kickoff. So brunch in the central time zone, 11 o'clock. That's on the SEC network. The CBS game of the week, 3.30 on CBS. LSU fresh off the win over Florida at number 12 Ole Miss. Coach, Ole Miss survived against Tennessee, but it took the entire game. This, this is going to be still a measuring stick for that program, I think. Yeah, I mean, you're reading all the – between the lines, or, you know, Coach Kiffin's talking about Corral might not be able to play. Uh, and certainly when you just start saying that, maybe he's in a position uh, – you know, he probably feels like he was in a 15-round heavyweight fight as much as he got hit last week. And, uh, you know, for the fans that don't know, I mean, the, the kid got 200 yards rushing and all that passing, and then he got hit a lot of times when he's throwing the ball too. So uh, I think that's the real key to this game. If for, for some reason he's not playing, that really takes a lot of muster out of this offense. Uh, we'll have to see what will happen with the, with the backup or if they go with uh, John Rice Plumley or what they do. But, 
But I will say this, that uh, as I mentioned in the get-go, uh, this LSU team's got a lot of confidence now. They're running game. All of a sudden, uh, I mean, this guy had the, the game of a lifetime against uh, that Florida defense with over 275 yards rushing himself and broke the record for LSU, all those great backs they've had over the years, and he broke the record. So they've gone from having zero running game to having one that's pretty effective right now. And even though Boutte's not in there as a receiver, they got a lot of other good kids. So if they can get some manufacture, some RPOs and play action passes, this Max Johnson can hurt you and uh, help their protection too. This is a this is a wounded zebra or wounded tiger or wounded anything you want to say team that has had a lot of things go wrong, but all of a sudden they feel pretty good about themselves and uh, they're going to get after Ole Miss. I mean, this this is a team that can really play pretty well on offense. Defensively, I still don't know what they're trying to do on defense. I mean, every week they look like they have a defense of the week that they try to play and they, they just uh, have a lot of visual coverage on defense. I hope the guy drops a ball or something, but uh, you know, and I certainly – don't want to demean them, but, you know, when you got corners out like they've got, then you're going to have some guys. But I will give them credit. They got some interceptions last week. What, they have four? Uh, really good job with that. So uh, this is going to be an up and down. I, I can see this game being 99 to 98. Uh, we can see an unbelievable. This could be one of those real Donnie Brooks. Well, it's one, you know, Coach, you mentioned the running game. Uh, Davis Price, the running back for LSU, 11 forced missed tackles, 14 yards of carry on counter plays, of which they ran like 14 or 15 times, I think. So, you know, Florida's going back to the drawing board in terms of how to defend that. Corral, I think you see him, if he does play, he doesn't play as a running QB. He, it's it's on, sort of only if necessary. It's more drop back RPO play action game for him uh, at the quarterback spot. But I think with LSU, one of the – you know, Coach, I know you watch this very intently, but when you look at PFF grades, Max Johnson's overall PFF grade right around 65 is uh, passing grade at 68.9. He's actually, to me, playing a lot better uh, than he's grading out just because of the level of difficulty, what he's avoiding in terms of the rush and making throws out off platform. You know, when he's kept clean, he's been phenomenal this uh, this season, but you know, it just is. It's far too often that he's not. Uh, but the he running game now help. coming there. He needs some help. He <laughs> needs some blocking. He needs some running. That's what you're talking about. I mean, he, he's doing all he can with what he's got. So you're making a good point there. Yeah. He's he, he played well. But like I said, like you said, Coach, I think this is just going to be a fun game. You know, it's these two teams, highly competitive. LSU now looking for a coach, sort of, I guess, <laughs> in the future. Well, who's uh, the but, other, other subplot in this game? Uh, you know, Coach O, uh, you know, he can surface back in coaching, who knows, but he's going back to where he started his coaching career, going back to Ole Miss. And, uh, uh, you know, not, he would like nothing better than to go in there and, and get a big win against a team that, you know, that he started his career out. So you had that plot to it, too. So uh, it'll be uh, it'll be an interesting scenario, emotional for him going in there and playing against his old uh, old team. We're seeing a lot of beat-up teams at this point in the year. LSU definitely fits that mold. Our next game at 4 o'clock on the SEC Network, same case with Mississippi State uh, against Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt almost got a win against South Carolina on the road, but uh, we did find out earlier this week that Will Rogers, the Mississippi State quarterback, AC joint sprain, and he played through it, and he looked quite uncomfortable for the majority of the second half of that game, Coach. Yeah, the one thing that you saw in this game that we haven't seen from Alabama is they got a good rush all night, and uh, you just they hadn't had that all year. I mean, and you would think that uh, with the way that uh, Mississippi State can protect that they wouldn't get uh, beaten on those those uh, single rushes like they did. But it was it was a difference in the game for Alabama. I mean, they held them. This is two straight years that uh, Mississippi State has to score a touchdown on Alabama, so. Uh, you know, we kind of got on Bama about the way they couldn't rush the passer against Texas A&M. And, uh, boy, they just did a terrific job. And then their offense was on fire all night. Whatever they wanted to do, they could do. And, uh, you know, if they can continue to get this kind of pass rush, it helps their secondary too. So uh, 
But as far as Mississippi State, they playing against the Commodores. I mean, uh, give the Commodores credit. They almost won that game. Uh, they had it won, and then Zeb Nolan comes in off the bench and drives in for the winning touchdown. But uh, I got to go with uh, Mississippi State. Got more players in Vanderbilt, but you never know. And uh, you get up there in that uh, Nashville environment with uh, less than 10,000 people watching the game, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, well, non environment. <laughs> that, that's not one of the road tests that I was referring to earlier. <laughs> right. Yeah. More of a non. Hey, but on the bright side, Vanderbilt scored. They had a lead, you know, well into the fourth quarter. Mike Wright playing QB, zero turnover-worthy plays. So, you know, some positivity uh, for Vanderbilt. But, you know, we talked earlier uh, this year and about how Leach in his second year and every year that he's coached, other than those first years with teams, he's been above 30 points a game. They're at 25 right now, a little less than 25 right now. So they're going to have to start putting some points on the board uh, to really get into that 30 range. And when you look at their schedule – can they get the bowl eligible? Because this win, I, I mean, if they you know win in this game, and then also they have a Tennessee State game later, but they have Kentucky, Arkansas, Auburn, and Ole Miss. Can they beat one of those four teams and get the bowl eligibility for them? And I think it would be a positive year uh, for Mississippi State. I think it's doable for yeah, them to go two and two in those games. Yeah, that Memphis game really is going to still come back to home. But, uh, you know, I think they certainly got – you said who was the – Mississippi State played who the four? Uh, so they got Kentucky at Arkansas, at Auburn, and then home Ole Miss last game of the year. Yeah, I mean. Go two and two in those, and I think you're in good shape. We'll see. And we'll see if that's possible. I, you know, I keep harping on this Kentucky on the path to 11 and one. Mississippi State may be the toughest game on, on their track to get there. We'll yeah. see. I have I, several teams here that – or looking at trying to make bowl Tennessee. Uh, I certainly think Auburn now with their five wins could probably go make it for sure. Now uh, they got South Carolina on top of that. South Carolina's got four, but you know, they got to play Clemson non-conference and uh, tough road to hope playing Texas A&M, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, but uh, they're going to have a difficult time getting there. I think. You mentioned Tennessee, rivalry game in Tuscaloosa, 7 o'clock Eastern time, 6 Central on ESPN. The Volunteers at number four, Alabama. Uh, really tough test for Josh Heupel. This is a, a very legacy to rivalry game, Brent. Any way that, that Alabama gets shocked a second time this season? I doubt it. And, you know, there's actually – I found this. I was looking. I, know, I knew that was a high number. 5,480 days since Tennessee has beat – Alabama. There's a Twitter site that that is dedicated specifically to that that updates that number every day. It's it's a long yeah, 06, 2006. But you know, hey, does Hendon Hooker is he is he a go? Does he play? Does he get, give them? Because I think if he doesn't play, then that chance of any sort of uh, thing just kind of goes down the the drain. But you know, for Alabama, uh, you know, to me, the impact that Jamison Williams has had on their offense cannot be understated if he's not there the transfer from ohio state that it just it looks their offense to me would look very average from an athletic standpoint you know as average uh, as probably, alabama can look probably would but they would use somebody else to help them but certainly you make a good point i mean he's he's like the fourth or fifth receiver at ohio state and he comes in there and jumps in at alabama as the number one guy but uh I just think uh, Alabama is a lot better offensively than everybody thinks. Uh, quarterback's so slick. Uh, they can run the ball with Robinson. Uh, those receivers are going to keep con continuing to improve. They got good tight ends. But, uh, as you know, I hadn't really studied that hooker guy. To, you made that stat last week about 35 runs and 25 of them he hadn't been tackled on. It made people miss. And watching him in that game against uh, Ole Miss, I'm serious now. This guy is a real deal, and he gives them a, an outstanding chance to make first downs that a lot of quarterbacks wouldn't make. And the more first downs you can make, the more explosive plays that fast-paced offense can run. So if he plays, they're going to give Alabama trouble just like Florida did. I mean, they're going to hurt them because he can uh, do, do a lot with the quarterback runs with RPOs. And, you know, Alabama tries to play you down in distance and play you 
you know, is it run or pass? When you got both of them against them or against any team, it's a lot more difficult. So I think that's a real critical issue in this game. Hooker plays, it'll be a lot closer than people think. If he doesn't, it could be really easy. The feel that I've gotten is that maybe the expectations were just so low, but that Josh Heupel has really exceeded whatever expectations were set for him at Tennessee so far this season. So to see how that develops from this point, once people begin to kind of have more respect for Tennessee, I'm curious how that goes. Tough game at Alabama. Um, I, I don't like the ball's chances, but like you said, Brent. It can well, it just goes to show how important the transfer portal is now and because – you can lose literally half your roster like Tennessee did and then import another half and, and be able to do some things. So it just – he's done a good job with it, and once he found out his quarterback, he really sort of took off. I mean, I think that's one well, reason. That- the comparison of the transfer portal uh, to South Carolina to Tennessee and look at the discrepancy in the personnel uh, when they both played. I mean, South Carolina lost all those guys. They really didn't get many in like uh, – uh, like Tennessee did, and that made the difference. And you give Hypo credit, I mean, they, they knew what their issues were. Uh, you know, same thing with Auburn. They picked up some some guys on defense that really helped them. And uh, that win for Auburn over Arkansas is going to go down as one that really put them pretty much – that and winning the, the uh, Georgia State game, this turned the season around for them. I mean, they could be really low, but all of a sudden – you know, uh, they, they got a chance against Mississippi State, against uh, Mississippi, against, you know, South Carolina. I mean, th- th- those could be three wins, and then all of a sudden he's at eight. And right there where Gus Malzahn is. Yeah, <laughs> Coach, Auburn actually controls its own destiny in the West. They're not going to beat Al- Alabama, though. Very unlikely. I will say the ability for a coach to transform a roster through the portal quickly – is going to get a lot of guys paid. I think it's one reason you're seeing Mel Tucker's name get lobbied out there because of the job he's done so far at Michigan State. Also, a lot of transfers on that team. And so a new way of roster management, and, uh, you know, we'll we'll see who it works for. Look, these games are tough at this point in the season and beyond. Even last night we saw an undefeated Coastal Carolina team go down, uh, you know, against a team that they're probably better than App State, but – We'll see what happens with the schedule here. Coach, you mentioned South Carolina, final game of the week in the SEC, 7.30 Eastern time. This is 6.30 Central in College Station, South Carolina at number 17, Texas A&M. Yeah, I don't know if they're going to give uh, Shane Beamer another cake. You know, he got a cake for winning his first SEC game against Vanderbilt. I, I think it's going to be hard to uh, for this team. You know, here's the thing. Those Aggies out there, and I don't mean to describe them as those Ag- – the, the Aggie Nation is on fire right now. Their last home game, they stormed the field. They beat beat a really good Alabama team, ranked number one in the nation. Then they went on the road and beat Ole Miss very – I mean, uh, Missouri very handily. Now they got, you know, a situation where everybody's going to go in there and be juiced up and ready to go. I mean, they feel like they're back to last year. And uh, Calzada, I mean, he's just – he really feels good about himself. Their defense is – this could be an ugly game. I mean, if, unless they turn the ball over, uh, I, I can't see South Carolina having much of a chance. Can you, Brent? No, not at all. It's a 20-and-a-half point spread. I bet I, I could see Texas A&M, barring giving the ball away a lot, covering that spread. Now, I will say, good for A&M that you got to play Missouri after your big win against Alabama. That helped out a lot. Because Zach Calzada kind of, you know, 50% passing, 64.7 grade, kind of went back to his normal self as opposed to his elite out-of-body experience that we talked about against Bama. He wasn't needed like that, right? You're right. That's a good point. And, you know, speaking of that, where do you, if you're A&M and you get, you know, get into these other games, what do you go back to? You go back to your best players. So last week against Missouri, Spiller, 20 carries, 168. A-chain, 16 for 124. I mean, those those are their two best players on offense other than the tight end. Go get them the ball. And go do your thing and, and move on and, and get these dubs. Yeah, they got three players there in Spiller, A-Chain, and Wiedemeyer that you've got to rate in the top 15 in the country offensive players. I mean, uh, get them the ball, let them deal. Uh, their line's coming around, but, uh, you know, they're going to be uh, – I mean, I don't – maybe they can lose to – 
Auburn or, uh, you know, who knows. But I, I think A&M's got as good a chance to run a table as anybody the rest of the year. Yeah, all of a sudden, I think it's on November 6th, that Auburn at Texas A&M game gets really interesting for however the West shakes out because A&M could knock Auburn off of its course of holding its own destiny. Uh, but at the same time – You're talking about Auburn has its own destiny. They can win the SEC West? Correct. They would have to beat Alabama to do so. They would have to win out. So, yeah. Yeah, they went out. They they win the oh, West. Hey, 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 you ever heard that song, Do You Believe in Magic? <laughs> hey, I mean, seriously, if they do that, I don't know what I'll do on this show, but I'll do something for you. But uh, if they went out, th- that would be – that would be one of the all-time coaching jobs, playing jobs, everything. I think they could lose out. I mean, it would feel like Auburn in 2013 for, in Gus Malzahn's first season. I mean, except, that was the crazy voodoo that was needed. Except for South Carolina, they, they're they not going to lose it now. I mean, I, I guess the whole point, Brent, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, three teams in the SEC control their destiny to Atlanta, Alabama, Georgia, and Auburn. Yes. And I think Mississippi State was in that bunch for a second, but I think you they really got knocked believe, out. You believe in that destiny, eh? Good job. <laughs> Control their own destiny rather than it being controlled for, okay, for I, like, I like it. Uh, all right. Well, this has been uh, Around the League from UGASports.com. We thank Connor Grady and Landscaping for sponsoring our show. Coach Donna, we always thank you for your time. We'll see you next Tuesday for UGA Sports Live, and then we'll be back next Thursday for around the league brent rollins i guess we get a week off from film don't lie although we've been doing a ton of analysis both uh text you and i texting back and forth about some yep. georgia players and uh we're putting some of that on ugasports.com as well yeah article coming out and they hopefully tomorrow uh looking at sort of the offense and, and the steps that they've taken from last year as well uh if you missed it coach donnan's comments on georgia's recruiting is at the beginning of this episode so you can scroll back to that if you've been watching live uh if you want more commentary on uga recruiting stay on this channel i think there'll be a new video coming up from our recruiting staff starting with roddy nabolsi uh, i think jed may is going to be available to join as well so you can uh, check that out i may pop on for just a second uh, if you want to hear me talk more so uh, thanks for uh, watching around the league from UGASports.com. It's presented by Connor Grading and Landscaping. We will see you next week.